Hello and welcome to another episode of Releasing Your Inner Dragon with Drake and Marie. Remember to like and subscribe. I know everyone says it, but it honestly absolutely does help us out. And if you want to continue to listen to these podcasts, you're going to have to help us out. I am Drake. I'm an award-winning author, creative writing teacher. I get invited to teach all over the world. And as always, I'm here with my wonderful co-host, Marie. I am a fantasy author and a YouTuber with a world-building channel over at Just In Time Worlds. And today we're going to talk about, so we've kind of talked about this topic before, but we had a request to go a little bit deeper than we did the last time. So we did a, a kind of a world building session a while ago. I don't remember how long ago it was. I've had cancer since then. So we did, we did that, but somebody wanted us to go a little bit deeper on, okay, great. You create your world, but how do you thread it in to your story without overwhelming the reader? And I think their exact quote was something like, you know, I just read something and the first I think you said 100 pages or 60 pages or some insane thing like that. 200 pages. Apparently the first 200 pages. <laughs> it was just world building and there was no story, no plot. Um, Marie loves to call this, it's a tour guide narrism, you know. And if you look over to the left, what we have is like, and it's, that is terrible. You know, that's just the writer falling in love with their world and wanting to, to give all that information. And even when that writing is showy, and, you know, there's no telling, you're not being told, this is not like a prologue. So it's characters doing stuff, but they're doing irrelevant stuff. So it's literally all just look at my cool character, look at my cool magic system, look at my cool world, you know, and none of it is relevant to the plot. And for me, what I always say is the, the, the trap that that person fell into, and I guarantee you, because like I've never been wrong on this yet, they're a fantasy role player. And they are probably a dungeon master. And this is probably a campaign world that they created. And so they're very, 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 very in love with that. But role-playing games are not novels. And I know you guys probably get tired of me hearing, hearing me say this, but just last night in my private writer's group, something came up that's very, very similar to this topic. And we were talking about scenes. And so to kind of expand on what Marie just said about the narration tour guide, we really have to understand that a story has elements that have to happen. So if we just break down a scene level, because it's the same for the entire novel. So this 200 pages probably had several different scenes. Now, the reason why I say scene and not chapter is because it's a, you, a chapter can have multiple scenes. But yes, most chapters are just one scene. Um, but I don't like to say chapters because that eliminates the fact that you might have multiple scenes. And if you do have multiple scenes, they still have to have these five things that I'm always talking about. So the five things that, that a scene has to have is they have to have a setup. And there are several little key things. You have to put it, you have to make sure the reader knows exactly whose head they're in. There's no head hopping in any POV if you're writing limited. So therefore, actually, there's no head hopping in any POV. But if you're writing limited, there's definitely not. So you have to ground them in the head of the narrator as fast as possible. You have to ground them in the scene. You have to be, they have to be able to see what the crap is around them as fast as possible. Sometimes, you know, we're going to look at a thing from Marie today where she takes about a page before you really get the full picture. And it's perfectly fine because what we do get is very interesting. And so we don't need to expand upon it. We'll get into that in a second. So, you know, that has to happen. The second thing you have to do is you have to introduce a conflict. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be the conflict of the scene. It could be anything, any conflict that makes it interesting that, that, that the character is railing against. And it doesn't mean physical conflict. It could be all sorts of things. And, and we, something that I'm going to do, actually, there's, there's conflict even in Marie's thing. So in both the things we're going to show today, there's conflict that isn't the conflict of the scene, but it is conflict that is interesting to read. Uh, it can be the conflict of the scene. We could just start off fighting ninjas. And that's the whole scene. But usually you're going to want to lead up to the fight with the ninja. So you're going to, but you still have to have something that's some type of conflict. You then have to have a rise in tension through the actual conflict. So the, the beginning conflict, if it isn't the actual conflict, it's going to be resolved in either it's going to be ignored, you know, it's going to be, oh, wow, we're not going to resolve this because something bigger just came along, or we're going to resolve it really quickly and then move on to something bigger. But, but once we get into that bigger, we're going to have to have a rise in conflict to the climax, you're going to have to have the resolution. And the reason why I say resolution and not overcome is because in a scene, all bets are off. It could be a resolution that is just a, okay, we've, we've, we've finished the beginning of this, but the next chapter is going to be the meat of it. But we still have to have some type of resolution that gets us there. Or it could be a resolution that the narrator failed at. 
or it could be a, re a resolution that the narrator exceed, you know, excel that or, or, or passed or whatever we want to say. That's why I don't like to use climax because the climax is going to happen at the end of our book. But in a scene, you just need resolution. And then the fifth thing is, is you have to have a hook that makes me want to read the next scene. And it is the next scene. So again, if you have multiple scenes in one chapter, you still got to hook me to read that next scene. If you are, are a narrator tourist and you're just showing me your cool world and your cool magic system and everything else, you are not doing any of those five things. Maybe you put me in someone's head, but who cares? I don't care about this person because there's no conflict. You're just showing me your world. So what we're going to kind of talk about today is because, you know, as Marie said, she runs an entire YouTube channel on world building. If you're not watching it, you should. There's some really great stuff in there. But so, yeah, you can go, OK, great. You guys developed this great, amazing world. But now how do I get it to my readers without boring the crap out of them, without becoming that narrative tourist guide? And so there is a lot to think about with this. And so I get why the person said, great, I want more. I want, I want a deeper thing. What about you, Marie? What do you, what do you kind of see about this whole thing? I already stole your narrative tourism thing, so <laughs> you don't get that. But it was so brilliant. You you spoke about role playing games, and it was actually role playing games where I first realized that there could be a narrative tour guide that is boring, and it happened. <laughs> so this is ridiculous. Okay, the GM did this. The GM was a tour guide. But the worst part was it wasn't his world. It was a store-bought world, right? So it was it was the world of Legend of the Five Rings, which is a, a samurai world that mm -hmm. I know super well, right? I've role-played in it. I've card-gamed in it, everything. And he basically, we would walk around like court and he'd be like, and there is Kashiko. And he'd describe this character. I'm like, my man, I have read every piece of fiction on this character. Why are you tour guiding me through her life? I want to play a game. <laughs> so it can actually happen in games as well. And it is always crappy. Mm -hmm. Like the only time when I want to read that kind of detail is when I'm reading a setting manual. Any other time I want to experience the world. I don't want to be right. told the world. The way I like to describe it is I always, you know, in, in my books and everything, I describe it as spice. World building is like spice. Yeah. Let's say you're making a, a pot of stew. If you put no salt in stew, it's not going to taste good. If you put a pound of salt in one pot of stew, it's not going to taste good. You have to put the right amount of salt in the stew to enhance the flavor, but not overpower the flavor. And so that's the way I teach world building and, and lacing it into the story. So a ton of stuff that I create never makes it into the novel. Now, because my stuff is so complex and insane, I do create a wiki. I think we've already talked about this at least mm -hmm. once that has all this campaign source material. Yeah, and yeah, eventually yeah. I might actually release that wiki to the world just to let you have, I mean, once it's all done and everything's out and everything like that, I'm not doing it beforehand because it also has massive spoilers in it. Um, but, but one day I might, you know, just make the, the wiki public. But that's the campaign source gu guide for me, well, not I, what I'm writing. I have a section at the back of my books where I put all of the relevant concepts, all of the strange words I use, all of that stuff, I detail it with like what these things mean and how they interact and so on. And if people want to, like it's it's a wiki. It's a wiki for everything world building that happened in the book. So if you're really interested and if the world building fascinated you, and if you, you know, want to see how I came to certain things and why certain things react that way, you can go to the end of the book and you can read all that stuff. It's there, but it's not part of the narration and it's not front loaded. And I, and I do a slim down version of that. So most of mine is the glossary, like because I have a lot of made up words. Mm -hmm. And the other part of mine is things like these are what the different coins mean fitted into each other. So there's so many of this coin into this coin. There's so many of this coin into this coin. And this is what a mint is. And this is like weird political details that will never make it into the book. Right. But then, they entertain then, yeah. me and they might entertain somebody else. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a shorter version of the Cimmerillion. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and that's great. And that's great. But like I said, that like 
for an example, in uh, Genesis, they don't have clocks. So I don't use minute. I don't use second or anything like that. So nobody waits a second because there is no second. But I also didn't want to use hour, even though hour has actually been a term that was used in, in our world before clocks. Yep. They had hours for some reason. I don't know why. It's That's always been weird to me. Word, I think. Right. I think. Um, but I didn't want to use it. So I made up. A, so usually when I make up words, I try to make them just the word is so close to the real world word. That, that, so like in the Genesis saga, it's called an arn. Hmm. You know, so one arn is basically the, the, the definition in the back of the book is the time it takes the sun to move a hand width in the sky. Hmm. And so it's ambiguous enough to know, well, what is a hand's width? Is it an open hand, a closed hand, whatever? But people pretty much go, oh, it's an hour. And arn is four letters, just like hour is four letters. And, and you know, people kind of make that translation. But I also, when I introduce the word, I try to craft the sentence to where you won't be able to miss the fact that it's an hour. And then the other thing that I do is I, I you know, I include like, like I have, like you, I've got, you know, unique um, times, time uh, counting me mechanics. And in the back of the book, I not only explain like exactly how the candle works and how you, you know, what, how our hours translate into their hours and stuff like that, which obviously would never be in the narration. Right. But I also have things like, this is the, in, in the case of Kiss and Gee, this is the history of the water clock. This is when they switched over to using mercury instead of water. And this is what, like, crap like that, that amuses me and will never make it into the story. <laughs> so let's, let's go down that path really quickly, yeah. because you and me say that all the time, and we know exactly what we mean. But let's expand upon that. What we mean by that, when we say it's never going to make the narration, what we're really saying is, the character who is the narrator knows this stuff at such a deep level that they would never, ever mention it. So it's just like when me and Marie start doing our podcast, I'm never going to say, hey, remember, Marie, me and you are humans and humans have to breathe air. So while we're doing this podcast, don't forget to breathe or you'll die. Like, that's such an insane thing to say, even though it's factual. Or, or even if we say, like, we're running out of time, we're never going to stop and say, and we have the digital clock now, but back then we had the pendulum clock, and the pendulum clock works with this spring that does these. You're never right. going to have that conversation. It, right. It's not going to happen. <laughs> right. So that's what we mean when we say it's never going to make it in narration is because there's it literally would be stupid for these people, even though it's brand new information that the reader does not have. And can't have, because we just made it up, this world, it's factual to the, to, the, to the level that humans needing to breathe air is factual. So that's an, and that is really relevant to our discussion, because when you're world building and you make something up that is so factual, it's the same as a human needing to breathe or they die, you can't mention that, even though it's completely made up and no one, you know, none of your readers are going to know it. So that's where you have to push yourself as a writer to come up with an organic way of working that in or writing the sentence in a way that the reader goes, oh, I've never heard this word before. But the way the sentence is written, I can kind of infer that it means an hour or I can infer that it means like there's a line that I, I use in my classes um, that's something like uh, it's, it's a stance that one of the characters making uh he's got two swords and he says he and i'm just quoting the line so i might quote it wrong but it says something like uh he held one sword out in front of him the other sword hovered over his over his head like the poisonous tail of a ceriza and pretty much everyone who reads that goes oh he's talking about a scorpion there is no scorpions in this world also i'm not going to describe what a ceriza is because First of all, he's in a fight, and that would throw everything off. And second of all, because of just saying the word hovered over his head like the poisonous tail of a ceriza, everyone who has ever seen a scorpion who's lived on Earth is going to go, oh, I get that, that he's holding the sword kind of waving over his head like a scorpion's tail. But since I don't have scorpions, I can't say the word scorpion. And since I'm not going to explain what ceriza is, I'm not going to... And, I'm, and I can't explain it as it's a scorpion-like creature because <laughs> they don't have scorpions. The reason why I wanted to go down the whole organic thing is because it does very much dovetail into what we're talking about here, which is how do we write things mm -hmm. in a very organic way? 
the general rule that I use, again, going back to my spice analogy, it's about putting the right amount in. You're never going to use all the spice that you created. You have jars of spice that you created in your backstory. You're not going to put jars of spice in your cook in the dish you're cooking. You're going to take a little piece from this jar and a little bit from this jar and, and maybe a, a bigger scoop from this jar, whatever. But it's just that. This podcast is is often about more practical things than you would get elsewhere. So I guess let's let's dive into the practical and kind of show some of that. So we actually went through some of our writing. So you want me to start? Do you want to start? Yeah, because mine's a different. We're yeah. gonna so we're gonna go through some of Marie's that is much more practical. It's it's a scene where we're gonna you're gonna it's the beginning of a scene too. So you're gonna see the the faux conflict. It's not the real conflict. We actually in what we're gonna read we're we're not gonna get to the actual conflict of this scene, but you are going to see the faux conflict of this scene. And then you're also going to see the world building. You're going to see the character development. And you're going to see a little bit of magic development. And this is all in everything, but really in fantasy, you're going to have to get stuff up to the readers that doesn't exist outside of your head. So this is their first introduction to it. It's their first. And so we want to do that organically without shoving the entire loaf of magic down their, their, their throat. When we get into mine, there's also different ways to world build. And the way the, the example that I'm going to do for mine is where I've used the baggage of what the reader is bringing into my story to my advantage to world build for them. And so mine is using a lot of subtext, whereas Marie's, we're going to look at, OK, this is all brand new stuff. There's no subtext to this because her magic system doesn't exist anywhere else. So we have to look for a way to organically get that to the reader. So since, if you're on YouTube, you're actually seeing the document, but Marie's going to read it. Uh, out loud and then I am going to cut in and talk about things every couple of paragraphs we're going to kind of talk about you know this and Maria might also stop herself and go okay so what I did here is x yeah. so Maria if you and we're going to read about a page and a half it's maybe 500 words or so but this yep. kind of shows yep. you the the more practical organic way to slip stuff in so this is a short story called an azure tassel uh, and it reads warm planks provided a springy launch point for Louis's feet he di the, his dive set the rowboat rocking. You're a wheel-trodden bastard sometimes, Louis. Giselle glared at him, wiping water off her nose. Louis laughed, drifting lazily on his back in the cool water of Rokai Lake. The boat swayed in the splashing waves left behind from where he had knifed into the water. So I want to want to stop you there. A couple really nice things about this so far. First of all, even if people have never been on a boat that's on a lake we've seen it we, we we kind of can get it it's very mundane it's very normal so she's not explaining a lot because a lot of this stuff is just I mean everybody has seen a boat or you know on tv or whatever even if like I grew up on a lake so obviously I've been in this boat and jumped into the water and all of that but not everybody has um I think most of Marie's lakes are frozen year-round so diving in that would be horrible I love picking on her about her winter wonderland we also have instant now this obviously is not the conflict of the story but literally in the second paragraph which is the third sentence or the you know third and fourth sentence of the piece we have a conflict between the fact that there's a girl in the boat who just got doused with some water and is upset and the guy who dove in the water who literally thinks it's funny and while that's not a world shattering conflict or anything like that We've also all been in relationships like this, either being picked on or being the picker on her. And, and so it, it, it beautifully gets the reader instantly into this comfortability of, oh, wow, I've seen boats. I've seen, you know, people picking on each other in, in a kind of friendly, loving kind of way. Like, this is very comfortable and, and interesting, and I want to see where this goes. And so that's what we're talking about, about in introducing a conflict really early on that isn't obviously this is not going to be the conflict of this scene because that would be a really boring scene if it was just a conflict about two people fighting over the fact that one of them got the other wet you know because he jumped into the lake so anyway just and 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 the other thing i want to point out is you really can't see the world it's it's kind of like a void but it's fine because there's only two ways to start scenes you either start them micro and work macro which means you start at one moment in time because the reader has to start at one sentence. You can't, it isn't a movie where you throw a whole, you know, picture up on the screen. However, you can start macro. It just, the line has to be something like, and the, the example I always use is, uh, Drake cast his gaze out over the vast jungle canopy. 
So I've started very, very big, but there's absolutely no details. And so now I'm going to have to go micro. I'm going to have to go closer and closer and closer until I finally get to, to where the character is. With most ways, most of the time, you're going to go micro to macro. So you're going to start with, I mean, look at this first sentence. Warm planks provided a, sp a springy launch point for Louis' feet. Like in this first sentence, we don't know anything. Is he on a diving board? Is he on a, is he on a, you know, a levee or a, um, a pier? Um, it could be on anything. It could also be the rooftop of some wooden building. We have no idea. It's micro, but it's an interesting thing to go, hmm, what, where, we, and then the dive set the rowboat rocking. Well, rowboats are not on roofs. They're obviously on water and it wouldn't rock if it was. I mean, it, it could flip over. It was dry docked or whatever, but we're going to assume that it's in the water. And so it's this beautiful organic way of getting the reader interested quickly and wanting to keep reading. And then we have this little conflict between this guy and the girl. We don't know if they're relatives or if they're lovers or anything yet, but because, you know, this is a banter that could happen between anyone who cares for each other. And so, you know, it's, this is just this is perfect in so many different ways that really starts this story off in, in a wonderful way. And I just wanted to make sure that we took a, took time to talk about that. So <laughs> thank you. Continue. OK, so it then continues a whole afternoon off and you want to come boating in that. He pointed at her bodice with its pleated skirts. It's not my fault. You're still a little boy shedding your clothes like a molting snake. All right, let's stop here. There's a lot of world building in those two lines. First of all, we get the fact, and, and yes, it is a, is a blatant tell, but when you do a blatant tell in dialogue, it feels more organic. So that first part of that, a whole afternoon off. First of all, that is something someone would say. I mean, I've said that many, many times, like, really, we come to Comic-Con and you wanna go to the beach. Like, <laughs> I get that it's San Diego, but it's Comic-Con week. And you're going to go to, because I, I literally said that because one of my friends, I got him and his wife tickets or his girlfriend tickets. And she spent the week, even though I got her a four day pass at Comic-Con, she was only at Comic-Con for like three hours one day. And the rest of the time she went to the beach or she went shopping. And I'm like, <laughs> really? Comic-Con? And you're going to go, you can shop anywhere. So th that's a very organic thing to say. People say something like a whole afternoon off and you're going to, you know, this is what you're going to boat in. And so one that points to the fact of what type of character the female is, Giselle. We do know her name. She's obviously probably a little more uptight than he is. She's trying to put on, you know, airs. Maybe she feels obligated to wear. We don't know yet, but we can start inferring some of this stuff. We can start getting this picture of what type of person this is just from that one line. Just the fact that, that he says, and you're wearing that, and she's wearing this, you know, a a bodice with a with its pleated uh, skirts. We also learn something about Louis that he doesn't take this seriously. He doesn't want to do this, and we get that from the next line. We also can start inferring their age because she literally says, "It's not my fault. You're still a little boy." Like that's literally something a girl would say to a, a boy. You know, you're starting to go, "Okay, they're probably te early teens or preteens even," because that's what we all said to each other at that age and we see other you know preteens and, and early teens say this stuff to them like it, it's that is what we're talking about about this organic world building and scene setting but she doesn't say you know louis who is turning 12 tomorrow <laughs> like that is such a terrible kind of way to do it we have this organic really and she also doesn't say you know rochelle who is always uptight and always wearing too many clothes because she always wanted to put on airs we don't have to say that. We can allow the characters to interact with each other in a way that shows this information, that, that the readers can infer this information and absolutely paint this picture. Now, you could say, well, but it's not really specific, so maybe a reader could misunderstand. Yeah, they could. And, and I don't want those people as my readers. If they're not smart enough to be able to follow that train of thought. Uh, so like last night, um, one of my readers in my private group, they had listed out they had that the, the 14 assassins were sent to kill this one guy. And then she had this line of, you know, you, you know, you have to understand that uh, the reason why they sent 14 guys after this one dude is because he's actually bad enough that any less and he wouldn't be in danger. And I'm like, if, if my readers can't get the fact that 
it's 14 on one and the bad guy chose to send those because the one is badass enough that he needs 14 to come after him. I don't want them as my reader. Like, I just don't. If you can't follow that, you're not smart enough to read me. Like, that's just the way I feel about it. So, yes, you could give me an argument that this is not detailed enough. But again, I don't want those readers. They're not going to be smart enough to pick up most of the stuff that I put down if they can't follow this. You have to give your readers credit for being and, – and the funny thing is is that there's a reason why I have a large fan base because they are that smart. Readers are smarter than you give them credit for. And to be honest with you, like when an author babies me, when an author stops to explain everything past every sentence, it frustrates me. Uh, it really makes me – in fact, I recently put a book down and I didn't pick it back up after like – 30 pages the world was interesting the plot was interesting but every freaking paragraph there was an exposition explanation of what these actions mean and i'm like i'm not dumb i can right. infer stuff <laughs> so it's really funny my life is divided into two halves there's pre-drake and post-drake and i literally do see the world that way because there are things that we'll talk about that i read pre-drake when i was just a fan mm. and and i'll go oh yeah that, great, that book was great and then i have to go wait a minute it might not have been great because I was just a fan back then. But there is one example of pre-Drake that got pissed off at that because pre-Drake would read anything. I'd read a, sh a, a shampoo bottle and I'd be like, this is great. Like I read everything as a child. But before I started doing this, you know, pursuing this career professionally, there was a scene that literally ticked me off from that. And it was Hunt for Red October. So it's during the fight scene where they're actually shooting guns at each other in the nuclear reactor room. And Clancy literally stops the story and says, now, Mr. Reader, let me explain why it is a very bad idea to fire guns in a radio, in the, in the, um, in the nuclear reactor room of a submarine. And I'm like, okay, so first of all, I'm pretty sure everybody would understand that you shouldn't shoot guns in the nuclear reactor room of a submarine when you're underwater. I think everybody should be able to figure that out. <laughs> Second of all, there's a gunfight going on. Yeah. Why, why am I not watching that? But Clancy so, does that so often. Right. He does, he, wow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. And like I said, that was like a 14 or 15 year old Drake or maybe yeah. a you know 18 year old Drake or whatever. I don't remember when Hunt for October came out, but it came out a long time ago. So it was pre-Drake, and that pissed me off even back then. Now yeah. I can't read it. I literally couldn't read that without throwing up in my mouth. So I, I just want to highlight one thing here in these, in these passages. What I also did with the clothing was I made deliberate word choices to use older names for clothing. Like briars is actually an old word, a really old word for underwear and bodice and pleated skirts and so on. So I emphasized the older words to set the reader's mind back into it being a faux medieval kind of world. Well, and let's, 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 cause you haven't read that line yet. So the, 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 it's the next line where Louis replies, ha, I'm wearing, uh, how do you pronounce that? Yeah. Briars? Briars. So I don't know what that term is. And so it doesn't do anything for me to take me back to any fantasy realm or, or olden days or anything like that. However, I can infer that the fact that she just said, you shed all of your clothes, and he said, yeah, but I'm still wearing X, I can pretty much infer that that means he's wearing a loincloth or underwear or whatever, and I don't have to know. So, so when we use words in this way, you really want to think as a writer, can the way I'm writing this double dip for both the people that understand what it is and give them the extra bonus of that, but still work for the people who don't get it. And so that's why that line works so well for me is because, ha, I'm wearing, you know, Bray is, I can say, well, obviously that's some type of underwear. He's not naked. She said, basically, you could infer from the top line, shedding your clothes like a molten snake. Oh, he just went commando and he's naked in there. <laughs> but then... He's not, he's still wearing something. So that I don't need to know what that word means to be able to understand that it's some type of undergarments. Yeah. And if I'm really interested, which I do all the time on words that I don't know, because I don't like not knowing words since words are my literal job, I would probably go, Brayas, what is that? And I would hit Google. For me, it's DuckDuckGo. Please don't Google stuff anymore. Anyway, um, I would hit DuckDuckGo 
and I would type in Brea's and it would say, it's an old type of underwear. And I'm like, see, I knew it was underwear. But then I put that in my brain bank of, oh, that's an interesting word. Also well done. Thank you. Although since I've given you all these compliments, I'm going to have to, um, uh, it should be a he replied period. Yes, yes, it should. It should be he replied period. This right. comes from, uh, I, 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 I was not so well acquainted with punctuation. So my early stuff has got so many punctuation issues. <laughs> I can't read my early stuff. I literally can't read it. Uh, Cause that was my early stuff was that preteen age between fan and writer <laughs> or professional. So just like every preteen going through puberty, you yeah, know, and yes, yeah. I was, I was in my twenties when I went through my writing puberty. Um, but still it is just as clunky and awkward as real puberty. So I cannot read my early stuff. I really can't. That's why when people say, well, you know, of everything you've written, what's your favorite? I'm like, the thing I'm writing right now that you haven't read yet because it's not published. Yeah. Everything else is garbage. Everything else. But you've won awards. Yes, I have. And it's all garbage. Like the thing I'm writing right now is the only thing I've ever written that's really good. <laughs> um, but, but it's not published yet. You'll get it. You'll get it next year. Yeah. And then I, but I know that the year after that, I'll be like, oh my God, I can't believe I wrote that piece of garbage. Like <laughs> the thing I'm writing now is really good. But that thing that I published last that year, that is terrible. terrible. <laughs> Anyway, so so he says, ha, I'm wearing briars. He replied, and anyway, there's a good reason not to be all formal and boat. Now here, I'm going to go into the actual magic system of my world. So it goes into very, it goes into narration here. Taking a deep breath, he dove into the icy depths, leaving his cousin waiting on top. At the lake bed, he paused to catch the rhythm of his heartbeat and reached through it for his Elamar. The hot power flooded his legs and he rammed his feet into the muddy bottom, hurtling to the surface through the cold water. The thrust carried him high into the air, breaching like a silver salmon in breeding season. He wrapped his arms around his knees and crashed back down to the water with a huge splash, drenching Giselle and swamping the small boat. All right. So let's unpack some of this stuff because there's some really good stuff here. She did not break into encyclopedia she didn't say you know taking a deep breath he dove into the icy depths uh by the way reader he is a mage and he has this thing called elama and how it works is xyz and it does this and it does that she you want to talk about how to do this stuff organically she just let the reader feel what he felt and then she just let the reader see what he saw I mean, he's doing the action but still he's jumping in the air and then she used a a, a simile the the silver salmon you know breaching like a silver salmon because people have seen fish break water she could have used dolphin if dolphins exist in this world if they don't then maybe they don't we don't have as far as i know and i don't know i'm not a, a salmon expert but i don't think we have something called a silver salmon we might but it doesn't matter because I know what a salmon is, so I can infer what a, you know, that a silver salmon might be something special to them and it might glitter and, and have different properties than our salmon does. But still, I get, I can still pull the vision in my head that he shot. Like, first of all, a, a normal person can't do that. You can't, you can't get enough inertia off of one push, even a swimming pool. Even if you're only in four foot of water, if you've been down, you cannot get high enough into the air to completely leave the water. The water just drags you down. So obviously something is happening. Obviously, whatever this Elama is, because we don't know anything if this is the first thing we've ever read. But we do get that it's something special because we we feel that it makes our legs feel hot. We we see that it allows us to shoot, you know, high above the water, way up into the air. And yet she didn't tell us anything about her magic she didn't describe an encyclopedia of magic so this is the, the again all of this is exactly what we're talking about when we're saying you want to organically thread in the the because notice the magic isn't important here he's not using this magic to save his life he's not using this magic to get out of trouble he's not using this magic to save someone else's life he's literally using it to show off that's it it's what he's doing. And so it, the magic is not important. And so it shouldn't be important in the narration. And so that's what a, a lot of writers will fall to the temptation of doing. They'll go, oh, but I love my magic system so much. I'm, and this is the first time I've introduced it. So I'm going to talk about everything about it because I'm a tour guide uh, instead of telling a story. 
Magic isn't her story. It's not the important part of this story. It's not the important part of this moment. And so she's going to maybe, maybe we'll get more. I mean, it's a short story. I don't know where we're going. Maybe we'll get more information later about the Elamah. Maybe we won't. Maybe Elamah has nothing to do with this story. And the conflict is something completely different. It doesn't matter. It's still just an aspect of the story. But the story has, 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 is about other things. And so we're not going to, and even if, it, even if he was using his Elamah to save his life, that still isn't the story. And so we're still not going to, we're going to look for more organic ways to get this information so that the reader starts to learn this over time. So anyway, sorry, I keep breaking in, but it's, there's such good stuff in here. Thank you. Um, yeah, but yeah, so so that was what I wanted to show was that he Elamar is the powering source and that the magic is geared in the body. It makes you stronger, faster, better than a normal human. That's what it does. And she didn't say that. Yeah. She just showed <laughs> pieces of it. Yeah. In a very organic way. Yeah, so then he swamps her and um, Louis, his cousin, exclaimed, holding out her soaked sleeves. Giselle, he, he mimicked her tone and chuckled, swimming to the boat. A wheel-trodden bastard for sure. She glared at him, drops of water clinging to her blonde tresses like glittering diamonds. I am, he agreed, in all possible definitions. But so are you, cousin. He hooked his arms over the side of the boat and grinned at her. His russet hair falling in wet strands over his green eyes. Stop, stop right there, because I don't want you to finish this line, because I want the line to go, but I do want to interrupt. So a couple of things about this. So first of all, we knew that they kind of had a relationship, but we didn't know if they were lovers. We didn't know whatever. He didn't ever say up at the top, um, scroll up a little bit to the top again. So he could have said in line two, you're a wheel trodden bastard sometimes, Louis. Gazelle his third cousin on his mother's side glared at him. Again, that is a very non-organic way to shove information into the reader's face. But people do call each other cousin or brother or whatever. Not Now, you don't want to overuse it or whatever, but this line in all possible definitions, but so are you, cousin. Like, people would say that. And so it's organic. We now learn that they're cousins. We learn that they that that's why they have the relationship that they have. But he she didn't write, you know, Gazelle, his third cousin on his dad's, you know, uncle's left side. Like we we get this stuff organically. And their relationship is world building. You know, yes, what things look like in animals and plants, but also just how people are is a part of world building. So anyway, the next I want to also, what, what I built in there is, again, I reiterated the wheel part, and wheel is capitalized. So mm -hmm. I'm building there on the religion, because they have a reincarnation-based religion. So the wheel is important. It's something that they swear by. Bastard, which means they have weddings, which means they have families, relationships, marriage. Mm -hmm. Well, and also, she organically, instead of, you know, because she could have written... Louis looked over the boat before he dove at his reflection in the pond and, you know, ran his fingers through his russet hair and wondered, you know, or and knew the reason why the girls all loved him is because how well his green eyes went with it. I mean, literally no one has ever thought that in their entire life. Now, no one has also ever thought his russet hair falling in wet strands over his green eyes. However... Okay you do have to understand that you are also in narration. So while you do not want to do the really horrible, I look at myself in the mirror and describe myself in every detail, if you drop in these little details as a part of the narration. So, you know, he's, she could have just written his hair falling in front of his face. Mm. That's literally all she's saying in that line. His russet hair falling in wet strands over his green eyes. But because you're giving a little bit of, description on the color of the hair a little bit of description on the color of the green eyes but you're not doing this entire info dump paragraph of louis who stood six foot three and weighed 275 pounds with 17 inch biceps and a you know nine inch penis like you're <laughs> not doing that you're doing this organically you're doing it in these little pieces of oh he has russet hair oh he has green eyes and you don't want to wait on this stuff anything you don't describe the reader is going to describe for you. So if I read an, uh, you know, three quarters of a book, and then you say that the character has 
flaming red hair. I'm going to be like, no, he doesn't. He has whatever I put into his head. You cannot wait till two, two thirds of your novel to give these details. This is on the first page. This is, I know we've taken like 15 minutes to read it, but in reality, this is like 10 seconds of reading. Yeah. And so we're getting this information in these little do- these little droplets and dollops. And, and that is, again, the quintessential thing that we're talking about, about organically getting this stuff in. So anyway, I just want to say all that because that's literally a part of the topic. Yep. So, <clears throat> so he's now gone in all possible definitions, but so are you, cousin. He hooked his, and, and then he hooked his and his green eyes. Okay. So then Giselle laughed and offered him a hand. Louis took it and his grin turned evil. Her eyes widened and she tugged against his grip. If you pull me into this lake, Louis, I swear my revenge will be both subtle and terrible. Ooh, a challenge. He yanked, flinging her over his head and into the cool water. She spluttered to the surface and glowered at Louis, the tip of her nose turning pink as it did when she was truly furious. Subtle and yet terrible, she vowed. Louis just giggled and hauled his slender frame into the boat. Giselle had started filling out her dress, but his voice still squeaked, and herself towered over him as though he was a little boy. Giselle paddled up to the boat, her skirts dragging in the water. I just want to pause here and say herself is capitalized. Herself is used as a name, which I find that a lot of people get immediately interested in that because it's not how you would say herself. <laughs> Help me up, you monster. Shivering, she stretched up a hand and Louis, Louis heaved her into the boat, the sopping wet weight of her more grown-up clothing making the task harder than usual. We should get back. He turned his gaze toward the rosy fortress nestled on the lake shore. Rokai presented a surreal vision, rising out of the green meadow to reach for the cerulean sky with its fluted towers. Yellow daffodils shone amongst the longer grasses and perfumed the whole scene in the glorious scent of lazy summer days. The fortress's pink granite majesty gleamed in the warm sunlight, polished to smoothness by centuries on this quiet lake shore. From the centermost of the three towers, the De La Roche serpent flew, a glittering blue jewel against the blushing flesh of the castle. Probably, Giselle took the seat at the rear of the rowboat. Your turn to row. All right. So, the first page, because this is literally the first paragraph of the second page. Mm. The first page is kind of in a void. We see a lake. We see a boat. We see two, two kids. And there's literally nothing else that exists in this world. But it's fine because what's going on is playful and interesting and engaging and and we start to actually get to know these characters and we get to like these characters you know especially the 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 he's going to pull her into the boat and she knows it and then he pulls her out of the boat and you know the fact that they have that little rivalry between them and everything like that i feel that that no reader is going to be like but i don't know where i am remember that first part of the uh thing on on what you have to do initially is you have to set the scene. She didn't set the scene as in the shoreline or anything like that, but she set the scene enough that it was all that I needed to know for what was going on at that moment. But she also didn't wait until the end of the chapter to explain more. So now we get this, you know, and it is a full paragraph, but it's very, you know, visual. It's very tactile. We get, we get smells and visual we get we get enough but it also we don't get the entire history of this castle but we do know it's been here for a really long time because it literally says uh, the stones polished to smoothness by centuries on this quiet lake shore so we know there has history we know this place has weight for those that are watching on youtube the castle is actually behind marie's head um in her little picture that's the lake that, that they're literally on right there we get this and it's just enough to flesh it out to continue. And then we're not going to continue on, but as you get through, you get more details of the castle when you need it and so on and so forth. So this is world building in a very organic way that threads the information that the reader needs. You still want them to be able to see what's around them, but you don't want to overload them. You know, maybe the shoreline was more important in the beginning. 
it's not for this little jumping into the water and pulling a girl into the water. None of the shoreline is important, so we're not going to mention it yet. But let's say the, that they're in the boat running from some orcs on the shore that are shooting arrows at him or something like that. Sure, you would then bring in what the shore looks like much sooner than this. It is all about understanding what the scene requires to keep the interest of the reader and then when we require more, because now we're expanding and we, we started micro and we're working macro. So the first page is this micro little moment of two kids in a boat on a lake. And we don't need anything more than that. We need this and we need to enjoy this moment in time. And it is one page. It is literally seconds of reading time. And then we get to, let's expand the world a little bit. And, oh, but we're still in a boat. And so we still have, and that's what happens. You still have some discussion in the boat and everything like that. And then it keeps growing and growing and growing. So this is the perfect quintessential example of, of what we meant and what we mean by saying you have to organically and personally look for ways to bring this stuff in. But again, she's, if you go back to my food metaphor, Every paragraph is, is a bite from the fork. Really, every sentence is a bite from the fork. But she is mixing the, 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 the flavors that she wants the reader to eat at any given time. And the reader should enjoy the meal. And so that's what we're talking about here. It's just, it's just wonderfully done. Thank you. And I do want to say just that that personal thing is something that I learned from you. And uh, the way that the castle is described, the way it is described in such very as evocative prose as I could write it. Um, you know, it's my best attempt at, at evocative prose because Louis loves this place. It is his home. Yeah. Let's say I was, I had been a prisoner in this castle for 15 years and I'm just coming back for the first time after escaping it because the, the empire was overthrown. I am not going to describe the castle with things you know fluting having fluting towers and yellow daffodils and and perfumes and yeah. and you know lazy all summer the, days <laughs> right I'm definitely not going to do this i'm gonna it's going to be an oppressive you know since it's pink and you do have the word flesh in there which is really nice but i would say you know i might describe them you know flesh like walls like rotted beaten flesh or something like that so i'm still going to be describing it but that's what we mean at least that's what I mean when I'm talking about making things personal. You have to understand you're not just describing the way the castle looks. You're describing the way the castle looks to the narrating character. And so, yeah, that's a great that's a great addition to this um, because those two characters are going to describe this castle very, very, very different. And so I do think about that when I'm describing things. It's always about how do they describe this this moment. And it makes it more interesting. It makes it, it also gives insight into the character as well and how they see the world. So that was my bit of, of world building. And now Drake is going to share and it will be my turn to say, stop, stop. I want to say something. <laughs> Although we're only doing basically a couple of paragraphs on mine. So you don't have to wait as long. So if you're getting antsy, it's all good. Uh, this is actually the first words that you will read if you get into my Genesis Oblivion saga. This is the opening of chapter one. It's called Property. The dull pain radiating through the beast's neck and shoulders goaded him from his slumber. He lay with his eyes closed for several moments, wishing for nothing more than to have sleep retake him. It did not. Stop, stop. Yeah. Okay. So in the very first paragraph, in the very first sentence, we have the beast in capital letters. So our narrator thinks of himself as the beast, which is a very great piece of character world building, right? Because if you're thinking of yourself as the beast, it probably means that you're a fighter of some kind. And you might even or, be, because this is fantasy, non-human. Or, or at least you see yourself as less than human or yes. less than whatever this world sees as human. Yeah. So, so just the name itself is a great piece of subtext world building. You know, the funny thing is, so this is the rewritten version of this. So if any of my fans are, are watching or listening to this that have read the original published version that's out of print now, it actually used to say his name. Um, but, and, and so several chapters from now, there's a reason why he actually learns his last name. But the reality is, and this is, so the original version, this was the first thing, it was the ninth novel that I wrote in my life, but it was the first thing that was professionally published. I was still, I was in that, that, um, 
that puberty f time of my writing career back then. And so now, since it went out of print and that published one out of business, and I got the rights back to it. I've rewritten it. It's going to would have come out this year, but you know, cancer. So right now, June of next year is, is my target date for getting this rewritten book out. You know, at, when I was, when I was in those preteen years of writing, I still didn't have the confidence to do stuff. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to give his last name because he wouldn't know his last name. Yeah, he wouldn't know his first name either, but I'm not brave enough to write a character that calls himself the beast because that is, and, and when I made the decision, so I've got about 50 beta readers, all sexes, all races. You know, I, I do have a very varied um, beta reading core and I do that on purpose. Um, but at the bottom of every chapter that I write, for those that are on YouTube, and we've talked about this before, but I'll just go ahead and scroll down here while I'm talking about it. So anyway, I have beta questions. And so some of them are that I ask for every chapter, like, was there something on the opening page that grabbed you? Um, what about the whole chapter? Did you want to read it? Were you able to visualize blah, 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 blah. But then I have personal questions through this chapter. And question five, I labeled big question. What was your feeling reading from the POV of a beast because even though i'm now much more mature as a writer and much braver as a writer and i do when i was writing this i was like okay actually this guy doesn't even know his first name he was kidnapped when he was two weeks of age and he's never and i'm kind of spoiling what something we're talking about in a second but he he doesn't know his name he never knew his name so with this rewrite i was like you know what I, and he sees himself as that he sees himself as an animal and so I'm like, you know what? I'm going to name him that. Now, I don't know if it's going to work. So I'm going to have to ask that question to my beta readers when they read it. And, and overwhelmingly, everyone was like, oh, no, it was really good. I really like the fact that I didn't know who he was. Because now in a few chapters, he doesn't just learn his last name. He actually learns his first name for the first time. And so it has so much more impact than it did in the original version. But again, I'm just a more mature writer, a stronger writer, more confident writer, willing to take these risks. But just because I'm willing to take the risk doesn't mean I'm right, which is why I have 50 beta readers and why I ask them very specific questions. And one of them for this chapter was, did I screw up? Like, I think it's pretty cool that, that your POV, because he's never called anything in himself or anyone else but the beast. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, did I screw up? D does that read okay? I think it's cool, but do you think it's cool? And overwhelmingly, all my beta readers are like, oh, no, that was really good. I really like that. Um, and so it, it is, you have to be willing to, to test it out and then also change it. If, if the vast majority of my beta readers come back and said, yeah, no, I didn't like that at all. It threw me out of the story. I would have gone, oh, well, that was a bad idea. <laughs> um, I thought it was cool, but obviously it's not. And I'm going to change it. So, so I just, I just quickly want to talk about um, my herself because she's my character that has that kind of nomic, like she, she's never going to be a POV. So we're never going to find out what she thinks of as herself in her head. But but there are people in the world, in, there are POVs who call her herself throughout the narration. They never think of her as anything else. Mm -hmm. And there are POVs who think of her by her first name. Because it depends on how they feel about her, how they met her, and whether they're intimidated by her. And that comes back to describing the world not as it actually is but as the narrator sees it. When you're in a limited POV, the, there's several reasons why it's called a limited POV. So again, we're talking about first person, third person, 300 discourse, which you're probably writing. So one of the limitations is it's limited by camera. The camera is attached to that character. So if the character walks out of the room, you've just, the camera left. You cannot continue discussing what's in that room. But another limitation is that everything is their opinion. There are no facts which is why they're called an unreliable narrator. They believe what they believe until they're proven wrong. And the reason why that is such a powerful tool for a writer is you're not lying to the reader. If the character truly believes that her boyfriend is literally the best boyfriend in the world and you spend time making the reader love this boyfriend and showing, you know, showing all the proof of how wonderful he is, and then later in the story, she walks in on him banging her best friend. You and the character both learned you were wrong on the facts that you had. And you don't feel cheated because you feel what she feels. She feels betrayed. You, the reader, don't feel cheated by the story. You, the reader, feel cheated by this guy that you fell in love with. 
And so that's another reason why it is so vital to really understand when I say make it personal to the POV is because what you're doing is you're describing the world as they see it, which gives you so much power, like we just went over with describing the same castle in two 100% different ways, if that's in your story. And that is so powerful to be able to do. And so, yeah, that, that because of how the character sees herself is how the character is going to describe her, both yeah. in their dialogue and in their narration. And here it is why it is so powerful that the beast is calling himself the beast, even in the narration and why it works so well for the world building. OK, you can continue now. Well, actually, let's expand upon that, because there's sometimes that I'll pop my uh, students on stuff where um, like they'll be in a well, let's say in your story, Louis, mm -hmm. and then in the narration, it'll say something like the boy cast his gaze to the shore. And I would say, no, no, absolutely not. Louis would never see himself as the boy. That is insulting to your POV. Even though he is a boy, he would never describe himself that way. And so now he might say he always felt like a child in front of somebody else, or he hated that they treated him like a child because they absolutely would think and feel those things. And you can write that in a narration, but you can't write. And then the boy jumped off the, the boat into the water because the narrator would never see himself that way. So... Once this beast learns his name, he now there is a time that there's some transition period that I have him, you know, still kind of narr the narration. There's a there's a moment where the narration says, you know, something like and then the beast did this. And then in her monologue says, no, I'm not a beast. My name is, you know, this. Now, you already know the name, but that's it's literally him talking to himself, driving that out of him. And then once that transition is done, he never calls himself the beast again. Mm. Not one single time in narration because he grows as a character and now sees the fact that referring to himself as the beast is an insult. Mm. And so that's, that's a part of showing the growth of this character as well. So normally, like in the original version of this, since I was using his first name, I never used the beast in narration. Mm. Other mm. people called it to him in dialogue, but he never... It was always like I normally say you should do with your POV characters. With your POV characters, you're really limited to their name and their pronoun. Even their title is insulting because, you know, I would never say, and then the writer went downstairs and, and got himself some pizza. Like, no, I'm Drake. I'm more than just a writer. I am me. And I see myself as, as all this stuff. And so it would be insulting to me to, to call myself, to see myself as only just the writer. And so it's the same thing with like the beast or the boy or any of those things. There's another character in this, Clytus. It's a 42-year-old jaded mercenary. And I would never say, and then the jaded mercenary, like, no, that is author intrusion. The narrator would never refer to themselves that way. So very important lessons across this. Mm -hmm. Your POV character gets their name and their pronoun. Unless, like, let's say we are in herself's head and she really does officially only see herself as, well, I, I always say, you know, people should know this. I mean, because some people, it's, it's so funny. They'll come out and they'll go, man, Max Alexander Drake, did your parents know you were going to be a fantasy author? Because that's like the best fantasy author name that, that, that ex I'm like, yeah, yeah, I made it up when I was 12. Like, <laughs> like I made it up when I wrote my first book. Yeah. So that's one of the things, like earlier I said, there's a pre-Drake and a post-Drake. Mm -hmm. That is actually a delineating line for me because that's actually when I adopted the persona of Drake as well. But now my friends and family call me Drake. Everyone calls me Drake because I don't answer by my real name because it's no, I don't. So if I'm actually narrating myself, I would say Drake got up and went down and got himself a glass of water. I would never say my real name because literally I've had family members that aren't around me much that will call out my real name and I won't answer because my brain doesn't connect it that they're talking to me. You know, if somebody says, hey, Jill, Jill, you hear them saying the name, but it ain't your name. So you, you mm -hmm. it's just a word. And so that's after almost 20 years of exclusively calling myself Drake, I don't, yeah, you know, when yeah. I, when I go to a doctor's office and they say my real name, it's always like this, oh, why are you calling me that? That's like, you know, why are you calling me Bob? Bob's not my name. And that's, that's not my real name, but it's the same thing. It feels the same. So yeah, maybe if we drop into herself's head and she truly sees herself as herself, the title, the, 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 the position 
that that she owns, then yeah, maybe we use that in there. But that's you were using that to show that she has it. She also embodied and you know, believes that she is this. So that's why with this rewrite, I was like, no, no, you're not going to have step this. He sees himself as an animal. And so you're going to, you know, and he refers to it and he doesn't just refer to himself as the beast. He also in the narration will say the creature. I didn't use animal, which I might do that because, you know, I might go back and use the word animal as well. And the reason why I don't feel that that is insulting to him is because it is actually how he sees himself. So, so I just want to say that I do sometimes use, like Louis, in Louis' narration, I do sometimes refer to the assassin, but I do it when Louis is doing something that he thinks of as himself as only the assassin at that point, you know, because he's now adopted that persona. He's about to slit somebody's throat. And <laughs> and, and that's fine. And again, yeah. it's, it's, it's depending on how you do it. But for the most part, yes, unless you have a damn good reason, if you're, your POV character should only in the narration refer to themselves by their name or their pronoun. Because mm. anything else is kind of insulting. Yeah. Unless, again, they've, if they personify it and you have made it very clear and you want to use that as a tool, then absolutely. All right. Anyway, you spent a lot of time on the opening paragraph. Um, I'm going to read it again just because it's been so long. <laughs> and it's only a couple lines. The dull pain radiating through the beast's neck and shoulders goaded him from his slumber. He lay with his eyes closed for several moments, wishing for nothing more than to have sleep retake him. It did not. With a groan, he rolled over onto his back and stretched as best he could in the cramped alcove. He'd awakened here for the past two ten days upon a stone slab in a tiny cell tucked beneath the Grand Coliseum of Mockley. Glaring at the ceiling, his eyes traced the wooden support beams that stretched out like the fingers of a giant hand. The rough-hewn timbers loomed in the deep shadows of pre-dawn, foreboding, oppressive, a constant reminder of his master's hold upon him that his life was nothing more than someone else's property. Okay. So I was going to stop you at the Grand Coliseum, but actually it works, better. It, right. it works better as one. Okay. Right. So what, what is really great about this is how well the subtext is used here. Grand Coliseum reminds me of Rome. So it puts me into the mindset of the classical period of our history. I'm like, okay, so Rome, big cities, you know, like strong armies. We're not looking at a medieval type setting here. We're not looking at faux medieval. We're looking at the classical period or maybe the, maybe the Bronze Age. But either way, like it's, it's not, you know, um, uh, the kind of medieval castles and, and nobles set up. So that's the first thing. The second thing is um, we know that we're using timber buildings as building materials. So we're not using plascrete or anything like that. This is not a future story. It's a past story. And then we have the masters, the, ma the word master combined with someone else's property. That immediately tells us that this world has slavery. We don't know what kind yet, you know, whether it be chattel slavery or debt slavery or whatever form of slavery it takes, but we know that we have slavery here and that one of our POV characters is a slave. And that is all done without once spelling that out. It's all we, subtext. We also, we also know what type of slave he is, what yes. he's being used for as a slave. Yes, because he's being used as a gladiator. We know that the, the whole description. At least we, we, we can assume that. Yeah. Yes. So we don't know. Wrong. We could be wrong, but, but right. it, is, it is a fairly safe bet. Right. And so the reason why this is a different type of, of world building organically than what Maria did is what I'm doing is I'm actually taking advantage of the fact that readers do come into your story with baggage. They absolutely do. So... The reason why this place is called the Grand Coliseum is because when you drop the word Coliseum, 99% of humans that are reading this are going to pull up the Roman Coliseum in their minds. So they're going to, just like Marie said, plus marble and, and kind of a more barbaric kind of, you know, game system that, that, that entertains with death and stuff like that. She talked about the, the fact that there's timbers holding this up. So we know that, that we're not dealing with steel girders and all that other stuff. But, but I want to point out something different to this because in the organic 
kind of talking about the organicness of it. So that, that paragraph, the glaring at the ceiling, his eyes traced the wooden support beams that stretched out like the fingers of a giant hand. The rough hewn timbers loomed in the dark shadows of pre-dawn, foreboding oppressive. So I'm not just describing, he was in a 10 by 10 cell with large wooden beams that held up the upper floors that stretched out at diagonal angles. I'm making it personal to him. So first of all, if you look at the, the verbs that I'm using through here, everything is m dirty and evil and dark. You know, the dull pain that radiated through his neck and shoulders goaded him. It didn't wake him. Goaded is an older word, and I do like using some, you know, more medieval type words. But goaded means poked, prodded. You know, I'm, I'm, the pain is, I'm, I'm almost, I'm almost personifying the pain i'm almost giving it a personality and saying look it's poking you it's like ah, i'm annoying you i'm a dude with a stick next to you i didn't say he woke up from his sleep slumber is also a word that doesn't necessarily mean oh he's getting good rest you know slumber means it, you know it, it for me it conjures up visions of of more restlessness or something like that and then when we get into the next line, he lay with his eyes closed for several moments, wishing for nothing more than to have sleep retake him. Even the retake him is, is more violent and more visceral. Mm -hmm. And then the, it did not. And so everybody's felt that. And I, 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 I hate when I want to go back to sleep in the morning and I just lay there and my brain is just firing a million miles an hour. And I'm like, fine, I'll get up. Screw you. Like, I would love one more hour of sleep, but you're not going to let me. And so everyone's felt that. And so I take advantage of that. But then he rolled over onto his back and stretched out as best he could, and he cramped alcove. Ten days, they don't have weeks in my world, but I don't tell you, you know, he awakened here for the past ten days, which is about two weeks. Like, I don't have to say that because just the way that the sentence is, is structured, when you say for the past two ten days, everyone's going to go, oh, there must be ten days in, in the week in this world. Okay. And you're going to see that over and over and over again, and I'm never going to explain it, and, and you're going to be like, oh, yeah, no, no, definitely that's a week. Um, but upon the stone slab of the tiny cell tucked beneath, like these are all dark, you know, glaring at the ceilings. His eyes traced, the beams stretched out. They were rough hewn. They loomed in the deep shadows, foreboding oppressive, obviously, or, or dark. So not only am I using the reader's knowledge to help me world build, but I'm also using the English language by very purposefully choosing the words because i you know the funny thing is i have the book behind me. here's the original award-winning novel but here's the exact same thing in the original version it might be interesting to pick on me from 14 <laughs> years ago but let me just read the first paragraph of, of the original and let's look at the differences in you know me now as a much more mature author versus this preteen author that wrote this Rolling onto his back, he laid down on the hard slab, on the hard stone slab that formed his bed and glared at the stone ceiling. Its wooden support beam stretched out like the fingers of a giant hand. Sleep had come little to him over the previous eve. Once more, he wondered how it would feel to have the ceiling come crashing down, ending his suffering and releasing him from his burdens. So in the original version, it's not horrible, but no, no not as if you were to just read this by itself there's a reason why this won tons yeah. of awards yeah they're like okay, that's good but here's the things that i don't like about it and the reason why i feel that i can't read myself from back then so first of all rolling over onto his back it, rolling is not as, not as, as strong as strong as what i'm trying to paint in this picture um he laid back is not as strong as kind of what i'm trying to because that's all it is with this yes i wrote he lay but he didn't lay back. He lay with his eyes closed. So that's showing that he has a desire for something that isn't just the laying. Whereas in this, I'm just telling you that he rolled over. Now he does glare at the stone ceiling. So there is that. Uh, but then I really just describe it. The, you know, it's wooden support beams stretched out like the fingers of a giant hand, which I, I like the line. So that's why it's in the rewrite, because I still like the fingers of a giant hand line. But now I'm just saying sleep had eluded him over the previous eve. So I'm telling you that he didn't sleep well, as opposed to when you read this, I don't tell you that he didn't sleep well, but you're like, oh yeah, no, he's not. It's not like he's getting good sleep. No one would walk out of this, this 
thing that I read here in the rewrite and go, oh, yeah, no, he's in a five star hotel with a you know really comfy mat mattress. No one's going to get that. Another thing that's that's different just to show you some small differences. So he in the rewrite, he'd awaken here for the past two ten day, two ten days upon a stone slab in a tiny cell. In the original, I wrote. He laid back down on the hard stone slab. So can I guess maybe it can be, but pretty much stone is is hard. So you don't have to write it's hard stone because it's stone. So, you know, back then I wasn't as savvy to cutting the words that are just kind of superfluous and, and redundant and stuff like that. And then, you know, um, once more, he wondered how it would feel to have the ceiling come crashing down upon him and he would suffer. And any, now this is before I started teaching worldwide too. So anybody that's been into my uh, show don't tell class, there's an entire page on not using words like wonder um, because it's a tell. As you get through here now, I'm then the rewrite, I'm way more wordy. I think the original chapter was, the, was about, um, I don't know, 2,800 words, I think, originally in this one. And the new one now, the 5,700 words that this document shows also includes my beta questions. I think it's about 5,000 words, uh, 4,800. So nothing different happens between the two chapters. And yet the original is 2,800 words. The rewrite is 4,800 words. And it's the exact same chapter. What's different is I now understand really how to get the reader's emotions going, really how to hook them into this stuff. And so I've got a lot of my beta readers because all my beta readers obviously are my fans. So they all own the original version of this. And then as I've been sending these chapters to beta read for me, you know, they get to see the, the old Drake versus the new Drake or the young Drake versus the more mature Drake. This is hard. This is why in my class, I always say it takes 10 years to become a professional. It doesn't take 10 years to learn these rules. It takes 10 years to understand how to implement them flawlessly where you're no longer thinking about, because I don't think about these rules when I'm right. You know, I have been doing this for almost 30 years now. So I don't think about this. I just do it because now I've trained myself over the decades to, to get to this point. But there's a huge difference. And so while the first version of this book won awards and everybody's like, especially my fans, like, I don't understand why you're rewriting. It's one of my favorite books that I've read it like seven times. And I'm like, well, you need to read more because it's terrible. I mean, I don't tell that to them because you can't tell that to a fan, even, even though it's my book. Because once they become a fan of it, it really is more their book than mine. But then I send, because I've had fans that are like, I, you know, why is it taking so long to get out the next thing? And I'm like, yeah, well, actually, it's going to be even longer because I'm going to get the rewrite of the first book that you already have out. And then I'll send them a couple of chapters and they're like, oh, my God, this really is better. Mm. And I'm like, yeah, it is. And so, you know, now they're happy that I'm, you know, that, that they have to wait extra time to, before the, the series is finished um, because it wasn't finished. Only the first two books of the series were published. But this is what we're talking about. This is the t this is the stuff that's very tough. It takes a long time to learn. You're going to have to push yourself for this. And hopefully this answers the question of how do you world build organically? How do you thread it through there? You either do it, mix it in with the action as in Marie's story, or if you have the ability to take advantage of what the reader is bringing in. And I do that all the time. So like, like the big church in this, uh, in this town of Mockley is called the Palentium. Mm -hmm. Now, and, and the, the only description I give is he walked by the Palentium with its large uh, marble columns and frescoes of the gods uh, carved across the, the edge of the ceiling or whatever it says. That's it. That's the only description I give about the building until later when you actually, the, the building mean, means something. But because I use the word palentium, which isn't a real word, but it kind of sounds Greek or Romish. And then you throw in frescoes and marble and everyone goes, oh, it looks like the Pantheon or whatever. And that's the reason why it's actually called the palentium. That's another thing I didn't, uh, earlier I used the word Syriza. For Scorpion, one of the reasons why Syriza starts with an S is because it the same letters. So the reason why my Palentium starts with a P is because it also the the Pantheon. Parthenon, yeah. Literally, I'm taking advantage of baggage that the readers are, are coming in with to help me describe stuff without me having to describe it. Mm. And so there's really kind of two ways to look at it. And I do both. 
Unfortunately, you can't always take advantage of reader baggage, but you absolutely should be anytime you can. So like I said, hopefully this, this answers the question. This has been a very long podcast, but this is actually a very deep subject. Yeah, I guess my, my summation would be, remember that you can use subtext. You can draw on things that the reader will bring in from our world and then just explain, just show how it's different. You know, if it's important, if and it's important to show. How so you can also use subtext in yours, not necessarily in world building, but in some things like how they were talking to each other, let us know how old they were or how young they were, I guess I should say. Like that's also subtext. You're allowing the, the, the underlying current of the text to give more information that is a, than is actually written in the, the actual words of the sentence. And that's what we mean by subtext is, is the sentence, the way it's crafted, the way it's presented to the reader is actually giving them more information than just the words they're written. And the way that the dialogue runs explains how old the characters are without saying how old the characters are, you know? So, and, and these things, this is, this is like use subtext and then otherwise spread your world building, give it to the reader when it's important and show it don't explain it <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, i guess another way to say that would be just allow the backstory to happen just like you would allow the character to interact with other characters you would allow a fight scene to progress don't treat world building any different don't force it don't go oh but they'll never understand unless i dump three pages of of the world history on them right now in the beginning yes they will if you allow the back the that backstory that history to happen organically through the story they will they will, as long as you're, you have to be a clever writer. You have to give it to them at the right times. We last night at the at the writers group meeting, there was a, there was a couple of that where they this one of the writers was a little vague in the first paragraph. Uh, he basically said the boy had an illness, mm. but then like three pages later, we found out what the illness was, and we were like, first of all, there's no reason to hide this. There's no reason to be vague in the beginning. If you give us what type of illness it is that's actually going to help the next two pages not hurt the next two pages mm -hmm. so you also have to be a smart writer and understand when the reader is going to need this stuff which is why you need beta readers so that when you make a mistake somebody can say hey if you had given me that information earlier i would have actually appreciated it. and then yeah. you go oh yeah. and then i said and also then it would mean you didn't have to do double dip in telling me that he's sick and then later telling me he's sick with what it is that's redundant you're just giving me double information you can do all at one time and be done Okay, so I think that is a good note on which to end this very long podcast, <laughs> and we will see you soon. Uh, oh, oh, wait, wait, just uh, on a side note, there was something you wanted to promote. Okay, yeah, if you didn't notice, we did our intro live. We just decided to do that today. The things that, the things that I'm working on heavily that you can reach out and touch, uh, one is the movie script that was supposed to sell or that had sold and then uh, the shutdown killed it. I did go ahead and get out. I've talked about it a few times on here. It's called Snurse a Magical Magical Fairy Tale. It is on Amazon. It's only in hardback because that's what I wanted. I'm probably going to release a digital version of it, you know, cheaper. But right now I just want it in hardback. So if you want it, it's not a real movie script because I, I want it actually readable and movie scripts are not readable. But if you've never read a movie script before, you will think it's a movie script because I still made it look like a movie strip. But it is absolutely fun. It is absolutely amazing for both adults and kids alike. If you have young children, it's an amazing uh, bedtime story. All my beta readers that had you know children between the ages of five and nine, they were like, "Oh my god, this is the f the only week that I've ever been able to put them to bed when I wanted to put them to bed." Because they were like, you know, "Hey, let's go to you know, let's get your get your teeth brushed and all that, so we can read some more snurse." And they're like, "Oh yes," and they would rush in. I mean, they liked it that much that they did their chores and everything so that they could get read snurse. It's also for adults, just like you know, all those kids' movie have plenty of entertaining for that so you can get that now it's really weird on amazon because if you search for maxwell alexander drake it doesn't show up for some reason you actually do have to search for snurse a magical magical fairy tale and then it does show up in my name but it's just not connected for some reason so i haven't had a time to figure out what's wrong with it um and then drake you since i'm now finally out of cancer and and have my beard back i am now starting to record more and more um videos so if you want to get more just really defined training where i really hone in on a topic and everything like that definitely um you know go and do that the text below i'll give marie a code uh for like 25 percent off the introduction package if you want to get one of the packages 20 25 off there'll be a code down below for that from my side 
if you hit my Amazon profile, which is linked down below, then you can buy my books, which I always appreciate. Do leave a review. And uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, Just In Time Worlds, and subscribe there, that would be amazing. And watch some of the videos, obviously. Okay, and we will see you soon for another episode. Thanks.